Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Francis Storrs, President of the City Club, and I want to welcome you to another outstanding program and welcome again our new live radio audience on KKGT 1150 AM radio. We are delighted to have the immediacy of the live radio broadcast as well as the live CityNet 20 television broadcast available to listeners. 30, once I led NAD 30, <laughs> as well as a live city NAD 30 television broadcast available to listeners once again. Today, our program will focus on the high tech uh, industry and its involvement in public policy issues with Keith Thompson, Vice President and Oregon Site Manager of Intel. Uh, we do have one new member in the audience, if I may introduce her. Michelle Neary is an associate with Barney and Worth. And Michelle, will you stand, please, so we can welcome you. <laughs> On Friday, uh, April 17th, please join us for a timely and very special program with Ambassador Joseph Wilson IV, Special Assistant to President Clinton and Senior Director for African Affairs for the National Security Council. Ambassador Wilson was with the President on his recent 12-day visit to South Africa and will share his perspectives on U.S.-South African affairs. We will be back at the Multnomah Club, so please do note that change in location. There is such a thing as a free lunch. On Friday, April 24th, we will move the program to the new Call Auditorium at Reed College for a program on higher education featuring Reed President Peter Koplick and Reed um, President Emeritus and President of the Oregon Graduate Institute, Paul Bragdon. Reed will be hosting us for the lunch, so reservations are required. No walk-in tickets will be available and please do note the change in location for that program as well. A free lunch at Reed on April 24th. A couple of announcements about some of the issues committees. On uh, Monday, April 13th, the Assumptions of Growth uh, Committee will sponsor a Growth Management and Environment Issue Committee uh, featuring U.S. Representative Earl Blumenhauer, and that will occur between 545 and 7 at Paddy's in downtown Portland. On Thursday, April 30th, the Science Breakfast, sponsored by the Technology and Business Issue Committee, will feature Nathan Tublitz, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Oregon with a presentation on how the brain functions. The Benson Hotel, Cambridge Room 730 to 9 is the location for that. You do need to make a reservation, so call the office. And also, please note in this week's bulletin, the special progress report from the club's Oregon Task Reform Task Force, chaired by Don Barney. This is a new kind of activity and committee for the club. They are doing an incredible job of researching what is currently happening in the state related to potential tax reform proposals. Read carefully what they have accomplished to date and what they plan to do before the next legislative session. Our board horse today is Pete Heuser, seated here at the head table. He is president-elect of the City Club and partner with the law firm of Kolish, Hartwell, McCormick, Dickinson, and Heuser. I love those names. <clears throat> he will ask the first question of our speaker. 
Following Pete's question, we will open the program, as is our custom, to questions from City Club members in the audience. And please approach the microphone while Pete is speaking. Do ask a question, a brief one, limiting it to 30 seconds or less. And we will ask that you begin to line up while Pete is still speaking so we can ask as many questions as possible of Mr. Thompson. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from Fred Meyer, Washington Mutual Savings Bank, and Stoll Reeves. We are very, very grateful for this support. Keith Thompson was born and educated in California's San Francisco Bay Area. He is the sort of California immigrant that Oregon is mighty lucky to have. Mr. Thompson graduated from California Polytechnic State University with a BS in electronics and then received an MBA from the University of Santa Clara. After a few jobs in electronics firms, he became Intel's 110th employee in 1969, one year after the company was founded. Today, Intel employs 63,000 people worldwide, and in 1997 had re revenues of over $25 billion. Intel's largest and most complex site, with over 11,000 employees, is right here in Oregon, in Washington County. Keith Thompson was responsible for selecting Oregon as an Intel site in 1976, and today, today serves as Vice President and Oregon Site Manager for the Intel Corporation. He is one of the few people I have introduced who has actually been trained for the job he is now performing. <laughs> Intel's financial and social impact on Oregon is enormous. They are Oregon's largest industrial employer and the state's largest corporate income taxpayer. Additionally, they have involved themselves deeply in Oregon's community life, and in 1997, donated over $4 million to local schools and community organizations, including 43,000 hours of employee volunteer time. In addition to his Intel responsibilities, Keith Thompson is a Port of Portland Commissioner and Chair of the Oregon Business Council's Education Task Force. He is a director of Portland's Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and is also a trustee of the Oregon Graduate Institute. Governor John Kitzhaber has asked him to chair his task force on implementing school form. He does have a wife who's here today and two children. He lives in Washington County but has no hobbies, never sleeps, and eats very little as nearly as I can tell. <laughs> Today, Keith Thompson will discuss high tech's role in shaping Oregon's public policy. Please join me in welcoming him to the City Club. Well, thank you, Dr. Storrs, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to have to reread what we sent you because <laughs> I, I think you must have been talking about somebody else in some of those areas. And in particular, I would like to thank the uh, City Club for inviting me here today to share our industry's perspective on shaping public policy on issues in business as well as quality of life. Now, for you to understand our industry, you really only have to remember one thing. The industry was created by engineers, staffed by engineers, and is managed by engineers. And while the stereotype of a plastic pocket protector full of pens and pencils and a calculator, in my day it was a slide rule hanging from your belt, is not particularly accurate. We are trained to think and solve problems in a particular way. And public policy and civics were not any of the core courses in the schools that most of us went to. And so to help you understand where we're coming from, what I want to do is take you through a brief history of how high technology has evolved in the state of Oregon and talk about the characteristics of our companies, how we think, how we operate, how we train our managers, how we make decisions, 
and also how we tend to interact in public policy. And then I'll close on those areas where you should expect to see us active. And in particular, I want to spend a, a long time in the area that we have a lot of passion for, and that's education. Now, as Dr. Storrs mentioned, Oregon is my adopted home. Like many in our industry, I came here as part of my job assignment with Intel. And I came for a two-year assignment. That was almost 20 years ago. You see, my wife and I decided that this was a better place to raise our one-year-old and our five-year-old than Silicon Valley. And that's even though I was born and raised in the Bay Area, although Julie was born and raised in Eugene and is a duck. So while she came home, I left home. Now I visit the head shed, or Mecca, as I call corporate headquarters, uh, in Santa Clara enough to know that we made the right decision. Now high tech, many of you think, is new to Oregon. And it's not really. Uh, back in the early 40s, a company known as Brown Engineering, we now know it as ESI, and Tektronix were busily building instruments. However, what is true is most of the growth has happened over the last three decades. The 70s was a period of out-of-state firms locating here in Oregon, Hewlett Packard in Corvallis, Spectrophysics in Eugene. And in 1974, myself and another fellow boarded an Air Cal flight, flew to Portland, found a realtor. They showed us a couple 30-acre sites, one off a TV highway, which we then purchased. And that was our first facility here in Oregon. You see, Intel was expanding out of Silicon Valley because we thought we saw the handwriting on the wall, congestion. And as a high-tech company, we tend to grow by hiring new college graduates and then training them from within. And it was not possible, or it was becoming not possible, for a new college graduate to come to Silicon Valley and be able to buy a home anywhere near within a two-hour commute. We actually pay our Santa Clara employees now a cost-of-living differential. As I sit on 101 going to the San Jose airport, I call it hazard duty pay. Well, that leads us into the 80s, and that was an era of startups and Japanese-based expansion. Venture Capital seeded a number of companies. I'm sure you've heard of them. Sequent, Mentor Graphics, Planar, Protocol Systems. There were a number of others. And not all of them were successful as the ones I named above. But that's another characteristic of our industry, entrepreneurship and risk-taking. At that time, Oregon was feeling the squeeze of a recession. And the state leaders looked around, and they saw what was going on in high tech, and they liked what they saw. So they asked us, what is it you need to continue the expansion? And the answer came back, education and research resources. Well, in 1982, our legislators were meeting in a special session. They were cutting budgets because of the tight times. But they put money in one new area. They put money into the Oregon Consortium on High Technology Education. And with matching funds from the industry, we funded new programs in engineering, computer science in both public as well as private institutions. That was our first major collective effort in dealing with the folks in Salem. And our trade association, the American Electronics Association at that time, put on a part-time lobbyist. That was the first for them in the nation and in a sense become a model for AEA across the nation. The 80s was also a period of time where our industry became higher education's most effective advocate. In conjunction with them, we targeted investments in engineering and computer science, and we also tried to make sure that faculty salaries remained competitive. Well, Oregon continued to struggle as wood products jobs declined. And once again, Salem took a look at high technology then Governor Vikatia was on a trade mission to Japan, and he was told by Japanese business leaders that they would never locate a facility in a state that used the unitary tax method. This is a tax methodology by where corporate income tax is calculated using what many people consider proprietary information. Well, the repeal of that law brought substantial investment to the state and more high-tech jobs. That brings us into the 90s, and this was a period typified by semiconductor expansion. Once again, Salem was continuing to look for barriers to continued growth in the industry, and they saw that there were semiconductor projects continuing to expand, but they weren't coming to Oregon. You see, our personal property tax methodology made the state uncompetitive when these companies were going through their site selection process. 
Well, in fact, one of the first jobs I had as Oregon site manager about five years ago was to accompany Governor Roberts and some OEDD folks on a trip down to Santa Clara where we met with our president, Craig Barrett. And Craig told the governor that they were quite pleased that the state had passed this legislation, but since it required local control and local process, and that hadn't been implemented yet, there were probably a couple projects that Intel wanted to do that may go to a different state. Well, the local process did get implemented, and the net result was not only did Oregon get two major Intel projects, but they also netted somewhere between 13 and $15 billion in state-of-the-art semiconductor projects. And that really supercharged the healthy expansion. So that brings us up to today, and I think it's clear that high technology is a key economic engine in the state of Oregon. The AEA does an annual survey called the Benchmark Survey, where they uh, gather data from our member companies. And from our 1996 results, we're currently gathering 1997 data, it shows that the industry has over 64,000 employees in the state, payroll of over $3 billion, and revenue of over $18 billion. As mentioned, Intel Oregon is Intel's largest uh, site worldwide with over 11,000 employees. And high tech has become the largest manufacturing segment in the state of Oregon since 1995. Over half of all Oregon exports are from high tech products. And the industry produces well paying jobs. Median salary in the high tech industry is over $47,000. And that's been increasing over the last few years at greater than 10% a year. And the competition for capable workers will probably keep that trend going. And it's good work, too. These jobs are interesting, challenging. They're certainly rapidly changing. And there's significant growth opportunities, as well as good benefits. The bulk of the companies offer tuition reimbursement, health insurance, retirement programs, bonuses, profit sharing, stock options. Ron Tonkin and his gang of car dealers know exactly when those checks are coming out, and they lay in inventory, and they love it. And these jobs should continue to grow. The folks that are interviewed in that survey project that over the next three years, headcount will continue to grow at 44% a year while revenues should double. So that's really today's industry. We're native born as well as newcomers. It's settled and secure in the state. It has invested in higher education. It has poured billions into facilities that has created thousands of high tech jobs and it has energized Oregon's economy. So let's turn to just who are these high-tech companies and how do they produce such growth? How do they operate? How do they train their managers and make decisions? Now you tend to hear a lot about the Tektronics and the Intel because those are the large firms and they're in the news, but you really hear less on one of our industry's major strengths and that's our diversity. Semiconductor expansion has been in the news in the last few years, the IDTs, the Fujitsu's, the LSI Logics, the Intel's. But when you really look at it, they're only about 25% of our industry. 75% of our industry are world-class companies producing products in computers, silicon wafers, test and measurement equipment, software, printed circuit boards, displays, telecommunication equipment, medical devices, printers, and the list goes on. And there's more diversity than just product lines. We have Fortune 50 companies with thousands of employees, and we have hundreds of small startups with one to three employees. The bulk of our companies have 50 or fewer employees. We have companies that are 50 years old. We have companies that were started last month, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear if one started this week. Now, the majority of these are located in the metropolitan area, but we're seeing growth outside. Ben, Southern Oregon, Salem, Springfield, Eugene, they all have high-tech growing communities. Now given our diversity in products and in size and in location and maturity, for you to have a one-size-fits-all expectation as to how we would operate within public policy would be a mistake. However, given our training, there are similar characteristics to most high-tech executives and certain attributes to our company cultures that can give you some clues as to how we will approach these issues. First of all, management style. Virtually all of our managers are trained engineers. And in social graces, many are considered social, uh, 
introverts. <laughs> now, Andy Grove, who was one of the founders of Intel, wrote a book on management uh, early in Intel's career called High Output Management. And he coined a term in that book to describe our management style, and he called it introverted intro extroverts. Andy told me over drinks one night that I was the role model for coining that term. <laughs> My wife can probably confirm it, too. Now, what that means is that we tend to be slow to react, but once directed or energized, we're like pit bulls, not letting go until we, we get to our goal. We spend virtually all our waking hours creating a product or a business. Another common view from Andy Grove is that only the paranoid survive. What that means is that somebody out there wants what you have, your success, your products, your market share, regardless of what it is. When we're threatened by competitive pressures or problems, we tend to pull in and focus on meeting the challenge. We're a fairly young industry. We grow our managers from within. Today's executives were yesterday's development and project engineers. I personally came up through the operations route at Intel and was responsible for plants in Puerto Rico, Malaysia, Ireland uh, just five years ago. So unlike more traditional management development programs in banking, utilities, or retail, public policy and community activities are not part of our job description or our reward structure. And we really have very few role models to follow. The speed in which our businesses operate is another characteristic in the high-tech industry. Innovate or die is our reality. 60% of our sales come from products that are less than two years old. We tend to be impatient when process is longer or harder than results. Successful businesses in our industry have to change their direction as the market changes around them. Intel has gone through three major strategic inflection points over our 30-year history. Our products are developed in less than 12 months, and that time is getting faster. In the time that it takes to build a freeway overpass or a major office building, most high-tech companies will have developed, introduced, shipped, and probably obsoleted two generations of their products. So high-tech leaders learn to make tough choices, embrace rapid change, accept mistakes and learn from them, and move ahead rapidly. However, being introverted extroverts and immersed in our business does not excuse us from being involved in community or public policy. In fact, we are finding that it is becoming more critical in many cases for our businesses. However, this is not a natural act for us. We're deliberately slow to enter a debate. Our energy will be focused on the critical few and where we can see results. You should not expect to see us everywhere. You should not expect us to just bring money to an issue. For when we do get involved, it is with a hands-on approach. You should expect to see us in industries or in issues that impact our competitiveness. And you should expect to see us involved in emerging quality of life issues. You should also expect to see us impatient when the political process, uh, because we tend to live in d uh, benevolent dictatorships. And we believe we ought to be able to make change outside as fast as we can inside. You should also expect to see us taking different roles depending upon the issue at hand. The analogy I like to use is a parade. Now you can lead the parade, be an active, visible leader. You can march in the parade, one among many supporting the whole. Or you can watch the parade. And that's keeping tabs on it, ready to jump in when you think you can do something. So now you know a little more about us, who we are, where we are coming from. We're basically a bunch of engineers. We're very comfortable with rapid change. We're focused in our efforts. We're deliberate in what we get involved in. We utilize a decision process that is based on facts and data. We are finding that's not very common out in the public arena. So what does the future hold? Where should you see us involved? Well, we still care about the issues that we grew up with in Oregon higher education, environmental management, taxation policy. But we're becoming increasingly concerned about quality of life issues, K through 12 education, transportation, affordable housing. 
Our goal is really quite simple. We would like to live and operate in a state that encourages the success and development of all of its citizens. Our belief is that this can be achieved by a balance between growing and vital economy and maintaining and enhancing the quality of life that is Oregon. I mentioned a phrase earlier, only the paranoid survive. A close friend and associate of mine even wrote a book using that same title. Now what Andy meant was by that was that someone out there wants what you have. IBM would certainly like to have some of Compaq's market share in personal computers. AMD would certainly like to have some of Intel's market share in microprocessors. Well, this phrase is not only true in business, but people in emerging countries want what we have. They're envious of our standard of living. They would like to have some of our material things. And they will work very hard to get them. Just go try and pronounce the names of the candidates in the major PhD programs, and I think you'll see what I mean. Now, we believe that you need to balance three public policy fronts, the economy or jobs, education, environment or livability issues. We believe you need a vigorous, growing economy to provide good paying jobs. Our industry has demonstrated that we do that very well. You need an education system that can provide skills matched to the economy, as well as the skills to be an active community citizen. And you need to use the resources generated by that economy to invest in environmental and livability issues like transportation and affordable housing so that you can maintain your quality of life. Now here's how I think you will see the high tech uh, operating in these particular issues. On the environmental front, we're marching in this parade. Oregon has a wonderful and commendable record. Community right to know legislation, a state super fund to pay for contaminated site cleanup, and the nation's first Toxic Use Reduction Act. And high-tech industry played a major part in coalitions to bring about these landmark laws. We also participated in the Metro Area 10-Year Air Quality Maintenance Plan that led to Portland being blessed by the EPA as an attainment zone. By voluntarily reducing air emissions, we not only got clean air for our residents and employees, but we also got the ability to continue economic growth without undue restriction or regulation. Well, that leads us into transportation. We are also marching in this parade. We don't need to look very far to see the growing economy's impact on traffic. Now, Oregon is fortunate to have had visionary leaders that forged an orderly structure to handle the issues of growth. And while comprehensive land use planning is simple in concept, it's very difficult to implement. But let me tell you, as I travel around the Intel world and see what is going on in other areas, these are absolutely the right issues that need to be debated. And we need creative solutions to balance the needs of growth with the evils of sprawl. You don't have to go very far to see what unplanned growth gets you. And we certainly don't need to recreate what they have in Seattle or the Bay Area or Los Angeles. However, while we debate these issues, we cannot afford to lose what we already have. Our existing transportation system is getting threadbare. And our elected officials don't seem to see a need to invest in maintaining it, let alone improve it. We believe that a successful transportation system is made up of three elements. First of all, maintaining what you have. Second, well-planned, cost-effective modernization of the existing system and mass transit. Not addressing all three of these, in our view, is inadequate. Affordable housing. Now, this is a quality of life issue that we all need to be concerned about, but it's also an issue that our industry doesn't bring much expertise to. And remember, we don't want to bring just money to an issue. We want to bring a hands-on approach. So we're currently watching this parade, ready to jump in if and when there is an area where we can add value. I now want to move on to an area where we really can add value, and that's education. Here you will see us helping to lead this parade. We'll be out front, highly visible. And why is that? Well, without quality of education, 
our industry really doesn't have a future. You see, we have only two raw materials, sand and brains. Sand, which is where silicon comes from, is very plentiful on Earth. Brains are pretty plentiful too, but well-trained brains are becoming in critically short supply. I want to be frank with you. Technology has shrunk communications, time, and distance, and companies will go to wherever they have to to find the trained talent to compete. This is not a threat. This is a reality in our global community. Without a world-class education system, we start a downward spiral leading to the loss of our standard of living and our quality of life. In higher education, the successful high-tech companies have gone through massive changes as their markets have evolved around them. Higher education is in the same position. Their world is changing drastically. And while their world changes at Pentium speeds, Oregon higher education is changing at 286 speeds, or even worse yet, like an Apple Macintosh. <laughs> <clears throat> and we're finding that uh, progress on large structural issues is very hard. The Governor's Task Force on Higher Education and the Economy worked for over a year and released a report late last year. And that report had meaty critical issues that needed urgent attention. Unfortunately, it was quickly dismissed as it came head to head with the realities of trying to change an entrenched political academic organization. However, progress was made last year in one area. The legislators invested $5 million in new engineering and computer science programs. And better yet, those programs were cooperative between PSU, OSU, and OGI. Better yet, they were in key areas in our industry, software engineering, electrical, and computer engineering. The legislators created the Oregon Engineering and Technology Council, chaired by Don Van Leuvene of ESI, another example of one of our people helping lead the parade. And while this is a good start at responding to the needs of continuing education in the metropolitan area, we need to keep improving and investing in this each year. Now, in addition to, to continuing education, overall quality and quantity needs to be addressed. Our industry has urged the state to put more investment in undergraduate education. This is not a new thought in the US. Similar to what the Morale Act did post-Civil War, where they established land-grant universities to link learning and research to agricultural and industrial development. And there is some progress being made here. But as we speak today, there are more sophomores that want to declare a major in computer science and computer engineering at OSU than they have capacity to accept. And what's even more tragic is there are exciting, well-paying jobs waiting for those individuals once they get their education. You see, Intel Oregon by itself hires more in one year than the entire engineering output of all Oregon schools combined. So Oregon policymakers have some tough choices to make on higher education. A state the size of Oregon, quite frankly, just does not have the resources to support three or more major research universities, let alone seven campuses of four-year schools. Restructuring and mission focusing, like what went on in Southern Oregon State University last month, is needed statewide. Now, while higher education has dipped its toe in the pool of change, K through 12 has jumped in and is swimming in the deep end. Oregon K through 12 schools are changing because their world has changed. Oregonians are raising expectations. New curriculum and instructions are being developed on the basics. And students are going to be held accountable to demonstrate proficiency, not just 12 years of seat time and social promotions. You and I can't drive a car or fly a plane without demonstrating proficiency. Why should you get a diploma without demonstrating proficiency? Higher standards demonstrating proficiency should bring us in line with how other countries are doing. Once again, as I travel around the Intel universe, it breaks my heart as I go to Ireland and Israel and see that we can take their high school graduates and with a small amount of skills training, integrate them directly into our fab areas while here in the U.S., our high school graduates required two more years 
of post high school training in math, science, and technology to qualify for those exact same entry level positions. Oregon school reform, when implemented, should fix that. Now, for high technology, this is not just our future, but it's also a quality of life issue for our employees. You see, our employees are a highly educated workforce who value education not only for themselves, but for their families. And when these young people are making their decision as to what company they want to go to, or where they want to live, or where they want to buy a house, one of the first questions they ask is, what is the school situation like? It is really all of our responsibility to continuously improve education. Now, high tech has taken a leadership role in education in the state. As I mentioned, Don Van Leeuwenay is heading the help leading the high tech parade. I personally chair the Governor and Superintendent School Transformation Advisory Council. This is a broad-based group of educators, business people, and education association folks. And what we do is we provide input to policymakers on the barriers to implementation of the School Reform Act. Implementation is one of our industry's strong suits. We have a number of other activities, too. In February of this year, National Engineers Week was held. This is a nationwide event where volunteer, volunteer engineers go out into the classroom. We had volunteers in Oregon visit over 650 classes, touching the lives of over 22,000 students. Real engineers standing up in front of students talking about what their day is like and what kind of education they need to get the jobs we have. Another program is Students Recycling Used Technology, called STRUT. This is a program where students refurbished used computers or build new ones out of donated parts. And then those computers go to schools where they're sorely needed. And a lot of the students that are engaged in this program were disengaged from school because they are tactile learners. They learn by working with their hands rather than sitting in a lecture. This program started at Intel and in Washington County, but has now gone statewide with many, many volunteers. We have trucking companies that provide transportation. We have companies of all sorts that provide the used computers. Even the state of Oregon is donating computers. Some companies donate money, and even individuals have called the 1-800 number to donate their personal computer when they were done with it. Our industry provides internships for students, and maybe even more importantly, for faculty through the Business Education Compact. We support a program called the Advocates for Women in Science, Engineering, and Math, which encourages young women to explore technical fields. Intel has a program called the Volunteer Matching Grants Program, where for an employee that volunteers 100 hours at their local school, we match it with a $500 grant. In the last school year, we were extremely pleased where we had 440 students volunteering over 14,000 hours, and we were pleased to award over $63,000 in cash to our local schools. Programs like SMILE, MESA, Junior Achievement, Saturday Academy, these are all supported by our industry, and they all have goals to get students, male, female, minorities, interested in math, science, and technology, and becoming lifelong learners. I want to be very clear with you, for high tech, education is not only a matter of survival, but also quality of life. And it should be for you also. You cannot assume that educators in high tech are going to handle this issue for you. Every citizen of this state must take a role in transforming and improving our schools. We all must understand and support and participate in making sure that our children receive the kind of education that will allow them to live complete and successful lives in the 21st century. The same way in which we are paranoid about our businesses each of you needs to be paranoid about our state and our country. As I said before, there are many folks out there that want what we have and will work very hard to get it. So if you're a parent, I urge you to get involved in your child's school. If you're a business, I urge you to provide a school-to-work experience. If you're neither of the above, I urge you to understand the issue and work to help uh, solve it. We can only make a difference by all of us working on this issue. We firmly believe that education is the core of all that we are and all that we can be. And if we don't keep up with the global village, there will never be enough money in any state budget to build enough prison beds, to support enough social service programs, to support enough health care programs, 
to invest in transportation, let alone build new transportation, in general to invest in our communities. And we will have started a downward spiral, and our generation will have wasted our prosperity that we are currently enjoying. You and I cannot let that happen. So now you know who we are, where we came from, what we're interested in. You know a little bit better about how we operate, how we think, and how we view ourselves in participating in the various parades, and what parade you should expect to see us in. When we're involved in public issues, we bring all that we are, all the characteristics that have made us successful. Dealing in facts and data, a disciplined decision-making process, a group of high-energy introverted extroverts. And we bring one more thing, that asset, our most valuable asset, which has made us successful. The talents and efforts of more than 64,000 Oregonians and their families who work in high technology. So on behalf of them, it's been a pleasure to share with you our thoughts for Oregon. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks, particularly as they relate to education. I'm hoping that some of our other members will follow up on that issue. I wanted to ask you about uh, an earlier topic where you talked about the development of the electronics industry in the Portland metropolitan area. Uh, you and I moved to Portland about the same time, in the late 70s. The economy was booming. Within a few years, though, we saw the timber-based economy on its knees. Um, I'm wondering, we had a program here a few weeks ago where some futurists talk about what was likely to happen in the future of the Portland economy. One of the more cynical people uh, uh, hypothesized that there was a biological development that we were mounting to our brains and it totally rendered computers uh, obsolete. Now, I'm not going to ask you about the likelihood of that happening, but, but uh, let's say there is a severe downturn in the semiconductor or computer industry. Are we, as a local and regional economy, as susceptible now to a severe downturn like we saw in the early 80s as a result of concentration in a timber-based economy? Well, it's an excellent question, and there's probably no easy answer to it. However, as I tried to point out, the industry in Oregon is extremely diversified. And a lot of people get concerned that the semiconductor industry goes up and down in cycles. Well, the semiconductor industry is only about a quarter of the companies here, so extremely diversified with diversified products. And uh, I, I, you know, nobody knows the future, but I think with the diversity that has developed, uh, there would have to be a pretty major downturn across the board in all products. Uh, to have a severe impact on the state. doesn't mean that there's never going to be an impact. But our industry goes up and down all the time. And uh, the nice thing about it is that as one segment is going down, another segment is coming up. And I think that's why it's important that the state maintain a diverse environment. Hi, Chris Smith, club member. Um, like you, I'm part of the high-tech community. I'm with Tektronix in Wilsonville where we practice one of the cultural aspects of high-tech casual Fridays. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about your philanthropic practices. Um, unlike many of my fellow engineers, um, or probably uniquely among fellow engineers, I, I spent five years on the board of a nonprofit theater here in Portland and was a little bit frustrated in trying to find support among the high-tech community, perhaps uniquely among other industries in Oregon for the arts. Uh, even to the extent of, of having difficulty with my own employer, uh, Tektronix, supporting uh, the arts. And I'm happy to say that, that at Tektronix, that's changed in the last couple of years uh, with, uh, with more funding of local arts organizations. But because of your focus on education, and I certainly don't want to be, be critical of your focus there, your philanthropy is very generous, uh, whenever we approached Intel, we were told that we'd love to support a program you do if you'll do it in Washington County and you'll aim it at school children. And you know, as a, a cultural arts resource that happened to be located in downtown Portland, we could very seldom meet those criteria. So I guess my question is, is what is Intel's philosophy with regard to supporting arts as a factor in quality of life and on a regional basis? Um, 
Our priority number one is education. And uh, we do have small amounts of support for the arts, but compared to what we do in education, it is quite small. And that's because we, we feel that you get more bang for your buck by focusing on a particular area. And so we focus on education because it is such a major issue for us in both our quality of life for our employees as well as for us as a future of our business. We just issued our last uh, year's report on all of our corporate contributions and Intel across the entire corporation donated over $96 million. 97% of that went to education. So we not only uh, say we focus on education, we follow it up with action in that area. Hi, Keith. Don Kramer, a City Club member. Um, uh, what is the role of the larger Oregon high technology companies in encouraging emer emerging growth companies and build building Oregon's entrepreneurial environment? Well, we have a couple different roles. Uh, first of all, we think it's in the best interest of the economy to have a vital growing economy, and certainly entrepreneurship is part of that. Uh, within Intel, we actually have two different focuses. We have a group that focuses on helping support external startups or, or emerging companies. And those are typically in areas where the technology is beneficial to uh, our product lines as well. We also have an internal organization that helps startup, uh, startups within the company. Um, so we're, we're pretty, we call it enlightened self-interest. We focus in the area that's important to us. Uh, which is technology, and we don't focus in any particular geographic area. We go to where the technology is. Steve Novick, City Club member and employee of the Oregon Legislature. According to the Legislative Revenue Office, it would cost $380 million to restore per capita spending on higher education in Oregon to 1989 levels and it would cost $340 million to restore K through 12 spending to 1991 levels. There are many legislators who would like to do both of those things, but they look at the budget and they see a budget that's 57% education, higher ed and K through 12, 12% public safety, 12% healthcare, which leaves 19% for everything else, um, the poor, the elderly, the disabled, um, state parks, et cetera. They look at the, that budget and they don't see what they can cut without being attacked. And then they look at taxes and they see, if we raise taxes on working people, we'll be voted out of office. If we raise taxes on corporations, we're told that all the jobs will leave. So they are in something of a bind. And my question for you is, do you think that it would be a good idea to get that $720 million back? And if so, is Intel prepared to either support a significant increase in corporate taxes to raise the money, or contribute tens of millions of dollars to those legislators who vote to increase taxes on working people to protect them from the attacks they will suffer in their next campaigns. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not sure that I agree with your premise that this is a money problem. Um, certainly, you can continue to throw money at the issue, but I think there's a lot of other things that need to be done in addition to trying to determine what is the correct level to fund education. And there are a number of projects going on right now to determine whether the funding needs to be higher or not, or whether there needs to be some other methodology by which the funds are allocated. I think we're getting pretty close on K through 12. You know, there may, uh, might need to be some ways in which they allocate the monies differently. But if you look at any benchmark data that I've looked at, and it's pretty sc scattered right now, and we need much better data, we're, we're roughly in the ballpark on educate, higher education. Certainly there could be more state support to keep tuitions down and things like that. But I think we need to be a lot smarter in how we're spending the money. There's still a lot of duplication. As I mentioned in my prepared remarks, a state the size of Oregon having seven four-year campuses is pretty difficult to fund all those campuses. When you compare it to a state like Phoenix or Arizona, where they have two major campuses for roughly the same population and they were able to fundle, fund all their development dollars into where the industry was developing around it. So I think we need to be smarter in how we allocate our dollars, uh, eliminate duplication and focus the charters of the various institutions. I don't see much hope for us eliminating institutions. I think we're past that point. 
but we certainly can take a look at uh, eliminating duplication. I just wanted to add that legislators who vote to abolish educational institutions will also be attacked and will need campaign contributions. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> John Leeper, City Club member. In your remarks, sir, you spoke about transportation, the fact that there is a need for additional revisions to what we presently have. My perspective is you at Intel are interested in it from two perspectives. First, getting your workers to and fro, as well as getting both your raw material as well as your finished project pro products in and out. My question to you is, how active has Intel been, as well as the electronic industry, in calling to the attention of both the elected officials as well as the general electorate the need for improvements in transportation? Well, I think we've been pretty active, and maybe we need to be more active. Uh, but we certainly were supportive of the transportation package that uh, was uh, in the last session. Uh, whenever we can, we try to bring it to our elected leaders attention that we can't allow the system to continue to degrade. We tend to do this mainly through our associations, uh, the Portland Chamber, the American Electronics Association, that sort of thing, as well as we do a lot of activities internal to our company where we are supporting mass transit as well as commute reduction, things like carpools, van pools, uh, preferred parking for anybody that will ride with somebody else and believe me in our industry that's a cherished reward. Um, bus passes, we run our own internal shuttle services so that we can get cars off the road as we go between our plants. Uh, I'm not sure what it's going to take to to bring it to our leaders attention but we will that will be on our agenda for next uh, session. I'm Gus Matisdorf, a member of the city Um uh, As I understand it, you produce a pretty specialized product of very high quality, which would be very difficult for somebody else to duplicate. So it isn't that uh, people who want to buy could go to one firm or to another firm or to a third firm. They have to come to you. Uh, to the economist, that raises the specter of monopoly that there is insufficient choice for the customer uh, among the people who would supply him. Uh, there's a celebrated case coming up in the newspapers almost every day now where that issue is being debated. I wondered what your take on it is. Well, I think your first two comments that we produce a specialized product of high quality was correct. Uh, the ability of uh, other people to duplicate it was not correct because they do have that ability and they're getting very good at it. And there's been a lot of media recently about um, a downturn in the high tech arena. And what that is is the underlying business is extremely strong. People are still buying PCs at 15 to 17 percent more per year. But the cost pressure because of all that competition uh, is causing these companies to have problems and lower than expected earnings, that sort of thing. So there's a tremendous amount of competition there. And while Intel enjoys a major market share now, as we said, we're very paranoid because there's a lot of people that are working very hard to get what we have. And so we try to run faster to stay out in front of them. But boy, there's a lot of them out there chasing us. I guess can you, can you grab it out of there? Like that, maybe? Uh, we can Does hear you. Work? Okay. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I understand you better now. The, my son worked for Tektronix and quit it very briefly, perhaps because of your benevolent dictatorship. I'm not sure. Um, it, let's put it this way. Uh, the contract that you sign when you start working. Uh, he kind of scribbled a little bit of it out and he says, well, that's fine anyway, we'll, 
we want you. Um, and then they came back later and said, yes, you're going to have to sign it the way it was written. Um, but believe me, he was treated well, very, very well. And he was inter um, interviewing people from Harvard uh, in other schools with a 3.5 average, and they still didn't qualify for the job. Uh, and um, let's say that my son does not have an education, and yet he was welcomed by Intel. But one of the things that he was interested in was teaching young. Uh, he believes the high school age is very good. And therefore, I was thinking, in tech high might be a good thing, a hands-on education by the two main um, uh, companies that started this in our area. Uh, I know that he would be interested, and I thought maybe your employees could kind of train them on the job to some degree, get them really interested, because they can see what happens. I can't comment on what, uh, whatever your son was signing at Tektronix. We don't have employee contracts, however, because we're an intellectual property industry, I think every, uh, most every company has you sign a, an agreement that you will not disclose proprietary information. Uh, and as far as uh, being hands-on learners, there are uh, programs like the Capital Center out in Washington County, which is a joint program supported by the high-tech industry, where we have high school students, two-year college students, four-year college students, workforce development, and it's, it's hands-on learning and the ability to blend all of those together. And we're getting a signal from the back. This needs to be our last quick okay. question. I think back there. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Andre Tremolay, and I am a City Club member, and I'm currently a consultant to a group called the Small Business Coalition in Oregon. It was really gratifying to hear about um, Intel's involvement in education and sort of preparing for uh, the next generation and involvement of people of different color and background. Um, my question to you has to do with not just Intel, but um, the, the community, the high-tech community. Its interest in involving people of color and women and others um, in, in the industry in leadership and, and entrepreneurial positions? Uh, uh, first of all, we try to have a very diverse work, workforce and hire people of all backgrounds. And once they're in Intel, it's then performance that counts. That's how they advance. We have an extensive internal training program where we teach management courses, leadership programs. These are open to everyone. And then it's up to the individual to get those skills and perform, and they will climb up through the ladders. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, thank you, Mr. Thompson, for taking your time to speak with us today. Uh, in notes describing this program, we asked, do we have a good neighbor in high tech? And I think we can answer yes to that question. I would <clears throat> I certainly encourage Mr. Thompson to visit California as often as he wishes, but never to stay and always to come back to Oregon. Thank you very much, and we stand adjourned. <laughs>